Our next presenter will be uh, Dr. Doug uh, Pfeiffer from uh, Virginia Tech. I'll be talking uh, on uh, presenting on our research projects overview that he's been involved in. Okay, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. What I'll be doing is I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, research we've done to date, uh, the status of spotted landfly in Virginia now, and uh, some slides on uh, new and, uh, and uh, developing research. Uh, so first of all, uh, the the research team on spotted landfly has expanded uh, at Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, Jason Bielski is a current PhD student working on this insect. Andy DeShane has, has finished up and so, some of his work will be included here. Uh, Alejandro Del Pozo is an ornamental entomologist uh, uh, in the eastern part of the state uh, who has just started working on uh, spotted landfly. Stefan Jaronski is an insect pathologist working on Bulvaria, which will be a key insect. Uh, Tom Kuhar, Scott Salem, and I are in the our faculty in the entomology department. And Scott is uh, mainly a forest entomologist working on, uh, among other things, Tree of Heaven. Uh, uh, on the extension side, Eric Day and two of our agents have been very prominent in spotted landfly, Beth Sastre and Mark Sutphin. Uh, in the uh, biology department, Dorothea Atoll will be talking about research by her and her graduate student, uh, uh, Ryan Ruther, tomorrow. So, uh, so, some work that we've been doing, we've worked on uh, the phenology and host range, or that we worked on that early on with uh, Andy DeShane's research, tree growth effects and geographic spread, and I'll talk about those topics first. Uh, I won't spend too much time on here. Uh, Andy worked, uh, had two years of data on the development of spotted landfly in Winchester in the heartland of, the, of this insect in, in Virginia. And, the, and the, the patterns were very similar across the two days with the eggs hatching in the last week of April or the first week of May with adults appearing in um, mid-July mid or so. Uh, we continue to add to the host list. Uh, this year, we added just a few more species, including hornbeam and, and pawpaw, but th th these are the, the hosts uh, to date in, in Virginia. Not, not as extensive as the overall host list that's known for, uh, for spotted lanternfly. There are some uh, you know, uh, ornamental herbaceous plants like cana lily on here as well. They're, they're not all perennial, tree, uh, perennial plants. Uh, and as was previously known, the, the host range constricts as the uh, insect goes through its instars and reaching the adult stage. Uh, with the adult, uh, second from the bottom, you see Tree of he uh, Heaven in gray is the uh, predominant host. Now, Andy looked at uh, Tree of Heaven, uh, or had a, um, a woody growth in terms of growth ring analysis in Tree of Heaven, Tula Poplar, and uh, Black Walnut. Uh, taking core samples in uh, a known infestations uh, zone in, in Pennsylvania, a couple of different sites in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, with coring and preparing of, of samples, he uh, measured uh, tree, um, tree ring uh, growth, uh, in, as, as you see here in, in uh, uh, the, the images. And he looked at, uh, you know, the, the several years post introduction of uh, spotted landfly and two different five-year periods before in introduction, pre-invasion one and pre-invasion two, uh, comparing with the five years uh, since the, the introduction. Now, uh, he showed that in both of the Pennsylvania sites, Upper Hanover and Blue Marsh, there was a re significant reduction in tree ring size in Tree of Heaven. Uh, as you know, you know, this is a, a, a very popular tree for, for this insect, and the insect spends a lot of time on Tree of Heaven, and that is uh, important for uh, compares, comparing with other trees. There were differences among trees in the, the tree, the tree uh, ring uh, uh, growth. There was no significant spotted lanternfly effect on either black walnut or tulip poplar, and uh, this is probably because uh, the insect spends relatively little time on these trees compared to Tree of Heaven. So we, we did not see a significant reduction from spotted landfly on those trees. Uh, so go, going back to Ailanthus or Tree of Heaven, looking at trees that were uh, sprayed with Donatefurin. Uh, in, in control trees that had not received the insecticide, there was the significant reduction in tree ring growth. Uh, 
uh, after either one or two years of insecticide growth, there was no significant reduction from spotted lantern So the, the neonicotinoid did protect the tree of heaven from uh, uh, growth reduction from spotted lantern fly. And this is just, just a summary slide. Okay, now uh, the, the current spread in the state, this is an, an ongoing distribution by this insect. Last fall, uh, uh, we, we generated this map ar around Frederick County in gray, showing positive finds of spotted landerfly. Our, the Winchester area of Frederick County continues to be the most intensive, um, intensely infested area in, in Virginia, but we've had considerable spread outside the, the county uh, now uh, with uh, locally heavily uh, infestations as we've seen elsewhere. Now in these maps, uh, by the way, the, the pink dots reflect positive finds and the black dots uh, uh, reflect negative finds. These are uh, from a survey 123 app that was developed with help from our uh, gypsy moth group and the entomology department at Virginia Tech. And so th this uh, uh, system is used by uh, a, a range of inspectors. So multiple people input into uh, these maps. So here we see uh, the, the, a statewide version, and we, and we see, uh, if I can get my cursor going here, well, I'm not seeing it myself. Um, in, the, in the middle part of the, 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 the slide, we see that a linden fly is spread down through the Shenandoah Valley. And uh, with a population in the, uh, the Southern Piedmont around Lynchburg, an established population there. And uh, on the right side of the graph, we see the increase uh, in infested acreage over the years uh, since Lindenfly was found in January 2018. At the end of the first year, uh, one square mile of infested uh, territory, and last November, almost 200 square miles in, infested in the state. This map was just generated by uh, Teresa Dillinger and Eric Day in our insect ID lab, uh, showing uh, again the most um, heavily infested area in the uh, northern part of the state. The red counties are the most heavily infested. These are the three counties that are included in the VDAX uh, quarantine area that was uh, established, I think, in, in 2019. The uh, orange areas are also uh, getting to be heavily infested, not, not in the declared quarantine zone yet. And then um, more lightly infested counties down through the Shenandoah Valley, and notably, uh, there are uh, two counties down by the North Carolina line in uh, Carroll and Wythe counties that uh, you did not see on the previous map. Th these were not reported using that um, uh, Survey123 app. So th these counties didn't show up on, on that map, but these are uh, uh, counties with a uh, sign of reproduction that are in the southern part of the state. Now this is a widely used map, uh, frequently updated in the Cornell IPM uh, 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 spotted landerfly site. And you'll see, you know, there's some differences uh, within Virginia, but you'll see the same thing in, in other states with red dots. The, the red dots include counties where spotted landerfly has been detected, um, uh, usually regulatory fines that uh, have not indicated uh, reproducing populations. And you know, because that difference gives rise to some minor differences you see in, in the distributional maps in, in Virginia and elsewhere. Now, proximity to vineyards. Uh, it, it, since uh, Linderfly started to spread, we've been following vineyards in the northern part of the state. In 2020, uh, you see um, indicated by the orange circles of uh, vineyard sites that were um, near the, the known infestation zone. In 2020, in the northern part, in the most uh, northernmost circle, we see a positive find. That was the first commercial vineyard where we found a spotted lanternfly. Oh, let me go back here. Now, you, you'll notice that, and this is a little bit dated now, this was in, in 2020, but uh, over in Clark County to the east, there in, in the town of Berryville, there was spotted lanternfly with negative finds at vineyards north and south of, of that town. And that uh, we believe is because Landerfly was following the, the rail line, which was infested with the tree of heaven along the, the rail bed. 
And so now uh, we, we will be seeing uh, lander fly show up in, in these sites as well as it continues its spread. In fact, in one of these sites, uh, it, it has turned up. Now, in the end of 2020 was our first uh, vineyard detection, a commercial vineyard uh, detection. And in this past year, uh, six vineyards have uh, become infested with spotted lanternfly so far. So what do we expect for 2022? Uh, we, we expect the, the list of vineyards to grow as spotted lanternfly continues its spread. And so the, the list of infested vineyards will grow in the vineyards that uh, were infested uh, previously, we expect the infestation to grow. And as um, you know, um, you know uh, both um, Richard Blair in Pennsylvania and, and Nielsen in New Jersey have noted was that about two years after the first find, there uh, have been problematic populations. And so we will be getting into that uh, this season, I think in, in uh, so, some of the vineyards. Uh, very often what we see is a, tr a tree of heaven growing uh, next to the vineyard. And in the lower left slide, a lot of those trees along the edge are uh, mature, uh, tree, a uh, large tree of heaven. So what are growers doing? I think a, 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 um, one thing is chemical control of nymphs and adults. And we heard that comment earlier. Uh, some growers have begun spraying for spotted lanternfly, even though the, the numbers of nymphs uh, or adults in, on their vines were, was low. And so, you know, that can be a problem. Uh, one of the main secondary pests that can be induced to pest status by broad spectrum sprays uh, are mealybugs, which are the vectors for uh, grapevine leaf roll virus, which is a growing problem in, uh, in Virginia vineyards and, and elsewhere. So uh, we really would like to avoid premature sprays of uh, broad spectrum insecticides. Also, tree of heaven. Uh, one of the methods for controlling um, spotted lanternfly is to remove tree of heaven, and a common approach has been to uh, remove tree of heaven by you know uh, cutting, removing, um, killing small trees, leaving a few trees, uh, treating with dinotefuran. Now, the material of choice is has been triclopyr, which, as was noted earlier, uh, can volatilize and cause issues with with grapevines. Now, one thing that some growers have done is just simply cut down trees of heaven uh, next to the vineyard, and this is the result. It, uh, this is what it was could be expected when you just just cut the trees without treating with herbicide. The trees sprout from roots and, and cut stumps, and you see that island of young, succulent, uh, vigorous trees of heaven uh, next to the vines. And these were infested with a spotted lanternfly in a second vineyard. We just see the same thing with uh, the, these vines were um, uh, just uh, next to the, uh, or, or the, these young trees were next to the uh, established vineyard and uh, these young, young trees of heaven were, were infested with Lycorma as well. Okay. Now, some new treatment, new um, area of areas of work. Uh, uh, Jason, um, our graduate student, is working on Bovaria uh, as a winter treatment, as well as um, looking at some uh, conventional materials as oversights. One, one uh, thing that Jason is doing is looking at uh, the effects of treatment timing. Since lanternfly is uh, uh, present in the egg stage for basically eight months out of the year, it seems like that would be a good uh, treatment window if, if you know, growers could use that, those whole eight months to, to treat the eggs. So we've been looking at the effect of treatment time. That will continue. And then uh, Alejandro Del Pozo has uh, started working on uh, spotted lanternfly management on ornamentals. And you'll see a couple of slides on, on his work as well. So uh, some slides from, from Jason's work. Uh, one question is, can uh, applications of Bavaria bassiana infect ha hatching spotted lanternfly egg masses? So not using it strictly as an oversight, but treating the eggs with the idea of uh, infecting nymphs as, as they're hatching. And so there are several related questions to that objective. Can winter applications of Bavaria bassiana survive until predicted egg hatch? And does application timing influence efficacy? 
And uh, does the, the formulation influence effi efficacy? There are two formulations of Bovaria bassiana GHA, um, a wettable powder and an uh, emulsifiable solution. And so uh, those are being compared. So here are uh, the materials um, being tried. Uh, 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 Bovaria is Armory listed. Uh, you know, there was a question in the discussion earlier about organic methods to control uh, spotted landerfly, and this is a potential tool since it, uh, uh, it is Armory approved. Uh, Jason compared uh, the Bovaria formulations with both a water treated control and an untreated control. Now, uh, a, a problem that has uh, been reported from Pennsylvania and New Jersey both is the distance from uh, known infestations to uh, you know, home research institutions. And that's certainly true with us in Virginia. The, the most uh, intense population is up around Winchester. That's a three and a half hour drive. We are able to do some work in our quarantine facility in Blacksburg, but there are some things we cannot do in the quarantine facility. No uh, insecticides can be applied there. And so that is uh, an impediment to doing the research. Now, as spotted lentifly is expanding its range, we hope to have some more practical uh, venues of research uh, uh, come up so that it'll make us easier for, to accomplish our objectives. So uh, in, in Jason's work, uh, uh, the first thing was to see if the, if we could uh, you know obtain spores from from treated egg masses and, and have the, have them germinate. This uh, base this uh, baseline uh, trial showed that we can. You know, comparing uh, the untreated control, which had no recoverable spores, not surprising. Both the emulsifiable solution and the wettable powder yielded uh, uh, germinating spores. Uh, uh, a after treatment, uh, somewhat higher uh, percent germination with the wettable powder than with the emulsifiable solution. Now, looking at the um, the uh, germination uh, after uh, after wintering, we can see that the the uh, in the dark in the green bars that after wintering, the germination uh, decreased. And this was especially marked in the emulsifiable solution. There, there was a, a difference between the formulations in this regard as well. Now, uh, looking at application timing, uh, in, in this trial, there are actually four bars there, but two, you know, the, both the water-treated control and the untreated control yielded no uh, uh, sporulated uh, Bovaria. But we see the, the, the sporulation uh, af uh, after a winter application was quite low compared to the spring uh, applications. So in the later spring uh, applications uh, resulted in higher uh, sporulation than did the, the early spring. So application timing does make a difference in the recoverable uh, spores. Now, uh, just a, another objective, I'm not going to re report on this today, but determining the effects of uh, different formulations of Bovaria bassiana against uh, 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 lenderfly egg masses when applied at different seasonal timings. You, know, so you, you saw some of the, uh, those results in the previous slide, but this will be continuing as, as well. Now, with Alejandro's work, uh, he is, uh, a, was attempting to use um, insecticides against uh, lenderfly on hydrangea. And so he has uh, caged trees here, uh, you know, caged, caged uh, lenderflies on, on the plants. Uh, he was not able to get adults to feed, to, uh, feed and survive on hydrangea. So the adult uh, trials were done on potted trees of heaven, as you see in this slide. So uh, he used two insecticides, donatefuran, a neonicotinoid um, group uh, 4A, and then with uh, Ventigra, a fetopyropen, which is uh, uh, a group 9D selective homopterin feeding blocker. And uh, with uh, the nymphs on hydrangea and the, uh, the adults on, on tree of heaven. The donatefuran had the greatest uh, de degree of control and um, um, with a high rate of uh, 
Ventigra, he got a statistical reduction of uh, uh, lambda fly nymphs. The uh, low rate was intermediate, uh, not, not different from the, uh, ne the neonicotinoid or the, the control. So that, that work will be continuing. Uh, uh, Alejandro is a new addition to our spotted lanternfly team. So I'd just like to recognize uh, the funding support from uh, the uh, SCRI grant, the Virginia Wine Board, and VDAX. And I, um, I have time for questions if, if there are any. Okay, thanks, Doug. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, yeah, I don't see anything in the question. And the Q and A, I'll see if there's anything in the in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't see anything in the chat at this time either. But uh, keep an eye on it, or if you want to keep checking on that, to see if there are there is any uh, questions. I'll I'll keep checking during the rest of the afternoon. All right, but yeah, thanks, Doug. I appreciate you uh, yeah, you waiting to present. Okay, uh, so we'll move on to the the next presenters who are from ARS. And they'll be talking. They'll be doing a research project overview, also. So it's uh, uh, Dr. Laura Nixon and Dr. Joanna uh, Elsonson. So I think Laura, you're going first. Is that right? Hi. Uh, yes, I am. I'll just, uh, okay. Is my screen up? Yeah. Yeah. It's in. Uh, you know, you can see the slides on the left side. And stuff, so. right. It's not the That's single good. slide or the presenter's view yet. Oh no. Not three screens up for some reason. So. Uh, okay, is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Grand. I'm stretched. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you that haven't met me, my name is Laura Nixon. Um, I'm going to be going first to do a little bit of a research update on some of the ongoing research uh, we're doing here at the Lefty Lab and we're at the USDA ARS in West Virginia. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, risk of spotted lanternfly for fruit trees. Um, I'm going to be specifically talking about apple and peach trees here. Um, so both apple and peach trees have been reported as FLF feeding hosts both in the native and uh, native range and then here in the US. Um, we do generally see um, SLF on apples and peaches here in the mid-Atlantic region, as you can see from these photos on the screen. Um, we'll see latent stars and adults um, on apple trees, and you quite often see nymphs on peach trees here. Um, another uh, uh, paper that I wanted to um, highlight here was the um, Seasonal phenology and activity of FLF in eastern vineyards by Leach and Leach. Um, so what the, what they saw there was when they were looking in vineyards that high numbers of adult FLF would be treated with insecticides, the population would be knocked down, and within not very long amount of time, the FLF population would be back again because of the high population pressure coming in from wild borders and such. Um, so we were really thinking about the effect of um, wild populations bubbling up within the borders of orchards actually coming into managed habitat within the peach and apple orchards. Um, so we very much wanted to focus on how SLF may affect young fruit trees specifically. Um, as I'm sure many people aware, young fruit trees undergo uh, a number of stresses. In this region, we've been seeing uh, increasing cases of rapid apple decline, taking out young apple um, blocks. Um, but both young apple and peach plantings often undergo stress from deer browsing, uh, increased heat and drought stress, fungal and bacterial infections, and of course, other insect injury. And this year was a classic example, we had Brudex cicada come in. So the research questions we really wanted to look at this year were, can SLF survive on fruit trees without any other host present? And which life stages that may survive well, uh, would they have an acute effect on the tree health? And if SLF feeding and population pressure, as observed in those Pennsylvania vineyards, occurred in young apple and peach tree plantings, would this have a negative impact on the trees? And um, can young plantings survive persistent SLF feeding? And if so, could those trees recover from this stress um, in the following years where no population is present? 
So for this particular trial, um, in the spring of 2021, we potted up 90 apple and 90 peach trees, all under two years old. Um, we pruned these down to three foot so that they were thick and advantageous. And um, once the trees leafed out, we placed them in these four foot dome cages and a local grower was nice enough to offer us space on her land where we could line these cages up and help to watch the irrigation. This was also really close to um, where there was a large wild population of SLS for us to take uh, insects from. So this was the layout of the cages at our site. Um, so the idea here was to infest half of the apple and half of the peach cages with spotted lanternfly over the entire season. Um, so every week for the treated cages, uh, we expose the tree to a standardized number of SLS um, as seen here on the treatment schedule. Um, so each week we went and counted how many of the SLS from the previous week were dead and we replaced them with an equal number of wild caught SLS to try and mimic that population pressure. And then uh, alternated within the layout, alternated in between each treated tree, there was a control tree, which was also in a cage, but it wasn't exposed to any SLS. So before exposing any trees to SLS, um, we took um, tree trunk diameter and tree height measurements. Um, and then once we had started to introduce SLS throughout the trial on a weekly basis, we counted the number of dead SLS and replaced them. Uh, we counted the number of leaves dropped per tree for treatment and control trees. We recorded any dead trees. Um, and then in between each life, uh, each life stage category, so the early and stars, the late and stars, and the adults, um, we also took photosynthesis measurements using both PhotoSync, which measures assimilation, uh, sorry, which uh, measures photosynthetic rate, and uh, we took ergo measurements at the end of the season, which measures assimilation. So just going to have a quick fire round of the results that we got from this first year of this trial. Um, so we were taking these measurements as we're exposing the trees to the SLS. So starting with the results for the apple trees, um, looking at the track survivorship of SLS, as you can see, the earlier instars survived pretty well on single apple trees. Um, but in mid-July, there was a drop off of survivorship per week, and it dropped off and stayed below 20% for the late instars and the adults. On the 13th of July, we also saw black sooty mold within most of the treatment cages. It was very light covering of black sooty mold there, rather than that really thick covering we often see photos of. Um, this is probably because there was a low number of insects actually surviving and feeding within those trees. So there were no significant differences in leaves dropped by treated or controlled trees. There were also no differences in um, apple tree growth, either diameter or height throughout the season. And there were um, no differences in either photosynthetic yield or photosynthetic rate. Um, throughout the season or at the end of the season between treated and controlled trees. Um, so no, no difference is really seen on the apple trees. So moving on to what we saw in young peach trees, um, as you can see, there was very, very low survivorship of, of SLS on single peach trees. Um, the only high-ish survivorship was with those earliest instars for the first couple of weeks, but even then it was still below 30% survivorship. And we did not see any black sooty mold in these cages, probably because of the very low survivorship. <clears throat> As with the apples, we did not see a significant difference between treated and controlled trees in terms of leaf drop throughout the season. However, um, and this is quite an interesting result, is the only significant difference we saw in um, peach tree growth between the control and treated trees was um, there was a difference in trunk diameter when the trees were exposed to early instars. So the treated trees that were exposed to the early instar SLS grew significantly less than those control trees. Um, that is worth noting because that was actually the time where there was highest survivorship of SLS on these trees. And then there were no differences in photosynthetic rates or yield um, for the peach trees either. Um, so that was us very much looking at the acute effects of SLS feeding on these young apple and peach trees. However, we would like to see how these trees do next year, um, whether there may be some kind of decline or whether the trees will do just fine in a year where there is no SLS population present. So in October, we planted up a peach and an apple block from these trees um, into uh, our research facility here. 
all of these trees will now undergo standard horticultural practices. And we've already started to take some measurements uh, now in 2022. So we are keeping an eye out every day to track the tree phenology of each tree, see if there's a difference in phenology between the trees within controls. We're also going to take spring, summer and fall measurements of photosynthetic rates and yields and tree height and diameter measurements as we go through. Uh, we will also be taking monthly visual surveys looking for stress factors such as ambrosia beetle and any signs of disease. Um, so overall, with, with uh, this study on young apples and peaches, we did observe a small impact on peach tree growth when they were exposed to early star nymphs, which was the life stage with high survivorship, but no other acute effects were observed on either apple or peach trees when apple apple feeding throughout the season. Uh, there was a low survivorship in later life stages, which very much aligns with some greenhouse data that we have for SLF survivorship on fruit trees. Um, Tracy is actually speaking tomorrow about a lot of our lab's research, so she'll probably be speaking on that. Um, so this shows that, uh, that data shows that SLF benefit from a mixed host diet rather than this kind of single host diet that they're exposed to. Um, but it is worth keeping in mind that this single fruit tree host approach doesn't actually take into account the heterogeneous landscape in which we live here in the mid-Atlantic. Um, so we may see different results if there were other trees in the enclosures with the fruit trees to support SLF survivorship. Um, so that's where I'll leave it for talking about host trees. And I'm just going to talk very quickly about a preliminary study that we did this year um, looking at nematode screening um, against uh, SLF at each life stage. So we started by screening um, five nematode species and strains against egg masses that we collected from the field. Uh, we took these egg masses, cut them off of the bark of the trees that uh, they were collected off of, and we popped them into individual petri dishes and applied these five, um, one of these five nematodes with and without barricade. And barricade is kind of a sticking agent that we use. Um, so the results, and then we, we left them for two weeks and uh, tracked the hatch after two weeks. Um, so you can see here that in terms of mean percentage hatch, there actually wasn't any significant differences between any of the treatments um, compared to water controls. So we took this uh, nematode screening to a semi-field. Um, uh, we took this to a semi-field for some reason, my picture for this disappeared. Imagine there's a photo there. Um, so we took this to a semi-field um, trial. So we were looking at um, S. carpotapsi, um, which had showed uh, promise in some very preliminary data from a couple of years ago against SLF. Um, so we treated um, egg masses that were still in situ on logs, and we treated um, each life stage, mobile life stage of SLF um, with um, uh, S-carb cap C with barricade and without barricade, and then water with barricade and without barricade with controls. Um, for the egg masses, we applied each treatment to um, N equals 15 to egg masses on their original laying substrate and quantified hatch after two weeks. Um, and then for the mobile life stages, we applied the treatment to uh, 12 inches of grapevine, and then we applied um, a bag with 30 nymphs or 15 adults onto that fine and recorded the survivorship for up to four days. We initially recorded survivorship for up to seven days, uh, but we actually found that after four days that even the control grapevine wasn't supporting the insects that well. So the results for the egg mass emergence, there were no significant differences uh, between any of the treatments there. Uh, for early instar nymphs, we actually saw decreased survivorship um, when the grapevine was treated with the nematodes um, and it didn't matter whether barricade was included compared to the water controls. And then we did not see any significant differences in survivorship for either the late instars or the adults. So overall with this, um, we don't think that at the moment treating SLF egg masses with nematodes is necessarily a good approach. Um, this could be because you kind of have to treat them with nematodes not long before they're due to hatch, and the egg hatch phenology of SLF is not very well understood. So until we do understand that phenology better, treating egg, mass, egg masses probably isn't the optimal approach. 
Um, s cover cap C resulted in lower survivorship of earlier synapse. So this is really promising. Um, if we can take down the earlier synapsal population early in the season, maybe that can affect the overall population later on. Um, so next year, we're looking at screening all of the nematode treatments um, from our greenhouse study against the mobile life stages of SLS. Um, and we're looking at treating full potted grapevines with these entomopathogenic nematodes um, and cage SLS with them to get a more full view of what is going on there. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to follow up with what Laura was talking about. Um, in order to do the, the nematode study that she just talked about, uh, we need to figure out some um, phenologies of the egg emergence. And so I worked a little bit on that early this uh, last spring, and I'll be doing it again this year. And today I'm also going to talk about um, a vitus species suitability study, um, work that I've done on vehicle dislodgement of SLF, and then working um, in the Virginia vineyards, um, which Doug referenced earlier. So starting with an egg mass emergence study, basically the, this was just an observational um, study to see when SLS emerged, how many emerged from each mass at each point, and then how long they stayed near their needle egg mass. And so we assessed this over time and collected temperature data and we did this in Winchester, Virginia last year on mostly tree of heaven, but other tree species um, and non living substrates were also included. And so we, we followed them at emergence and counted at, and then also at, um, I should say, two and four hours. Um, so these are just some photos of what I was seeing in the field. Um, so the middle one is probably about halfway through their emergence um, cycle. Um, they're still hanging in the, within the egg mass itself um, while they're um, uh, still uh, sclerotizing and getting their egg, uh, their legs out and whatnot. And then some egg masses we observe emerge all at once, or at least seem to. And then other egg masses, as you can see in this bottom left photo um, at the bottom, there's some that only have a few that emerge at a time. And then some that obviously have, have many. And so uh, we just characterize all of the different emergence. Um, and so what we observed was that uh, over time, uh, the average number of um, SLS that emerged from egg mass was about the same, um, right around 14 per day. And, uh, and then they didn't really stay too, too long at their natal egg mass. So it, it seems as as soon as they were able to move, they would move and move up the trunk. Um, and so because uh, temperature had a large impact on both when they emerged during the time of day, as well as, um, as, well as uh, how long they took to uh, basically flaretize and, and start moving, um, it seems like temperature is, uh, is a major factor in their emergence. And so we didn't see any hatch when temperatures were below uh, 47 degrees. So in mid-May, when they first started hatching, hatch wasn't until after eight o'clock in the morning. And then by the end of it, in, in the 22nd, 23rd, it was, um, they were hatching before five o'clock um, and moving right away. So uh, it really does spur their, their activity. Um, also of note is that most uh, masses we found uh, did not emerge all at once. Um, so we only had average of four. And so it seems like each of these uh, will have more than one emergence date uh, for the masses. But this is something that we're going to look at further this year, um, looking at emergence rate over time of pre-selected masses and then quantifying the failed emergence. So either there's a large winter mortality or we're going to have more than one emergence date per mass. Um, moving on to a VITA study. So previous work done by, by Laura um, and others in our lab looked at the development of SLS on different hosts. And so her first study used Vitus rotundifolia, which is a muscadine species, and um, looked at its ability to survive um, on, on either just uh, rotundifolia or it, when it's paired with tree of heaven. 
And so at least for the Carlos variety, we were not able to, um, they, SLS were not able to complete development and died off when they were in their third instars. And then when it was paired with Tree of Heaven, we still only had 25% of survival to adulthood. And then in her second study, she used uh, a different kind of grape. So she went with a wine grape, uh, Riesling, and you were able to complete development. And we saw 40% survival to adulthood when it's paired with Tree of Heaven. And, and again, not significant, but um, still some, somewhat 25% survival to adulthood on grapes alone. And so that kind of led to a, a, a study that we're going to be investigating the different kinds of um, vita species that there are um, locally and, um, and assessing their suitability uh, for, for SLS. So we're gonna repeat this work in uh, the ARS quarantine facility at Fort Dietrich in Maryland. And we're going to use um, five different vita species. And we're going to start with 30 first instars that have been hatched from egg masses that we collected. And we're just gonna follow development until they all die out um, in these cages. And so the species that we're going to evaluate is uh, wine grapes, two different varieties, uh, table grapes, uh, retentifolia, and um, a wild grape species, and then having a um, tree of heaven as the, the control. And then some other work that I'm gonna be following up on this year is work that I did using a laminar flow wind machine, wind machine to look at how and whether SLF are able to cling to uh, vehicles um, and what kind of factors influence that ability to adhere. And so, we used just um, a station vehicle um, and uh, we placed adult SLF on different parts of the vehicle and, and different material types. So we had placed on the hood and side panels, which are painted metal, um, the windshield and side mirrors are glass, and then um, rubber uh, and uh, is the wiper plates. And then we had different uh, weather conditions and we had different, um, we had both males and females. And, and then we had a, another factor was whether or not we allowed them to acclimate on the surface before we turned on the wind machine. Um, and so this is just a small video of placing the, the adult on the, the hood of the car. And then this is slowly ramping up the speed. So the motor is getting slowly turned on. Um, the RPM is increasing um, constantly um, until you get to the end where it's, um, it's a lot higher, it's at the max speed, and then the, eventually the, the SLF flows off. Um, and so some of our results is that while uh, there was no influence on sex on the ability to adhere to these surfaces, um, not unexpectedly, uh, rain significantly decreased the ability to stay on a car. Um, the material type had the, the most influence in, in terms of rubber was the, the, you know, the grippy material that they faced, um, whereas painted metal um, had the lowest retention um, overall. And um, acclimation time also uh, increased retention. So if you're, uh, if this SLF dropped from a tree while the car was moving, it probably wouldn't be able to um, adhere and stick on. And so we're gonna be um, repeating this next year or this coming year with different um, life stages and, and different factors and looking at where they end up after they get dislodged and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the maximum time we tested was greater than eight minutes at max speed. Um, which ended up being around 50 miles an hour. So the data that we're gathering here is going to be useful for intercity um, and localized movement. Not, we're not talking highly. There are outliers and that's how we get new populations. And so, um, it's important to know that like 
even if we didn't have many that that did get up to max speed it's you're still going to have some and that is important for like the outward invasion and then um i'm working in in the vineyard and in, in virginia looking at uh seven different vineyards that were in both frederick and clark counties which is up here at the top of the stick shenandoah valley um and while there were no known infestations um at the, the start of the season. And so we did bi-weekly sampling um, beginning in July, and we just sampled the perimeter of um, the, the vineyard block. And we sampled every 10th plant um, along the row itself and every five uh, vines um, along the rows, um, along the rows. And later in the season, we also counted egg masses and when they got to be high populations, we stopped when we got to 50 SLS per plant, um, just because it, some of them had hundreds and it would take a long time to do that. So, so this is just a, a graph of where we were sampling in Virginia. Um, most of five of the seven um, vineyards were in proximity to the main Winchester uh, SLF invasion and two were outliers. And so this is similar to, um, I'm overlaying the graph that Doug showed you um, just a few minutes ago with the, um, with the, uh, the purples being positive finds and the blacks being uh, not, not being found. And so all the blacks are, are where the vineyards were at the beginning of 2021. Um, but by the end of 2021, we found SLF at all. Um, six of the seven vineyards. The only one that didn't have it was the one that was located um, in Clark County, which was east of Winchester. And, and you can see in these graphs that um, there was a large number of both adults and egg masses on grapevine in three of the vineyards. And we were thinking that likely these three vineyards had overwintering populations because we also saw units um, in these, um, in these fields and in these wooded edges. Um, and then when we started seeing adults move into the, the grapes, those that probably had overwintering populations uh, began in mid-September. And then those that got um, SLF for the first time this year, wasn't they weren't found until October 1st. And they remained in the wooded edges and we didn't find any egg masses in any of the grapes. And so heading into 2022, we have six positive vineyards and we're going to be adding more um, in Clark County to kind of further follow this invasion. Um, and then we're also going to include a geospatial analysis because we saw some interesting distribution patterns in some of these vineyards. So for example, this is a, a vineyard block here um, where the green rectangles are is where the tree of heaven were concentrated but they were also, that was the only area where there was tree of heaven next to this, um, next to these grapes. But what was interesting is that we found the majority of the SLF when they were in the, the grape vines, they were concentrated on areas that were away from um, the tree of heaven. And so we had smaller populations that were next to the tree of heaven wooded edge. Um, and so we saw this at multiple locations. So we're gonna be investigating this um, this geospatial uh, feature um, more thoroughly this year. And so I think that is my final slide. Yes. And so I want to thank um, everybody at our lab and our collaborators. And if there's any time, we can uh, Laura and I can take questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. And thanks, uh, Laura. That was, they were both great presentations. Um, there's two questions in the um, Q&A. One is from Kelly. And she was just asking how long after early instars were removed did you measure peach tree calipers to detect treatment effect? Um, it was actually the day of, so basically um, the day that the uh, early instars were removed, we took all the measurements and then put later instars in. So Laura, can you refresh my memory how many days they were on the trees? Um, so each life stage category was on for four weeks. So it was a season long exposure. Thanks. 
Okay, and then there was a, another question, at least in the in the question in the Q and A section for Joanna. It said, "Are you planning to look at, apart from survival and development time, also female reproductive development, or fecundity, if possible, of the nymphs you're going to rear on the different vitus species compared to Tree of Heaven?" Um, we haven't talked about that, but that's something you can definitely investigate. Uh, yeah. John, I have a question on or a okay, comment yes. on, on the on the map. You know, with that map, where you show the the red zone in the vines that had a high population. If I'm interpreting that map correctly, I think that might be uh, right next to where that uh, stand of tree of heaven had been cut down, and there was that island of uh, really young succulent, uh, uh, young tree, tree of heaven growing there. We'll have to compare notes and see if that was really the case. There were no tree of heaven there when I was sampling these areas even but, okay because i think yeah. the grown, a grown may have gone in and, and uh you know killed the, those young ones after after we had um found them so you know that there may have been some movement so uh, we'll well i'll look at the map more closely 